Wow, what a professional. I didn't know that I'd be able to play the theremin that well. In this uh, last video of the series, we attempt to load the antennas so that they're more sensitive. And we try to get some linearity out of the box. And as you can see, some ventilation is required in the unit. So I did have to add some features that allow the air to come through. Look at these vents I had to put in. So that's a, a key to getting stability and not having to let the thing warm up for two hours. Welcome to part five of the mid-century theremin project. So it is quite stable. You know, it remains on zero beat pretty well. We have two oscillators beating, beating against each other. With like luck, the two tend to drift the same way. That tends to stabilize things as well. So it's holding frequency, I think, good enough. Once we get the varnish on the coils, let that dry, I think things will be fine. So before I start the loading coil, mounting and uh, adjustment. I want to make sure that all of the wires, especially the wires that go to the speaker, are tied down with uh, P-clips and there's no wires that are going to vibrate against the soundboard, against the baffle. Believe me, this thing can make some crazy buzzes if there's a wire that wants to resonate at certain frequencies, so we need to get all of that tied down. So I had an early failure before I even got to the antenna part. I had a part fail. It's this capacitor right here. And the way it failed is uh, I forgot to put the VR tube back in, the voltage regulator tube. So the voltage on the screen of the 6BE6 uh, clap oscillator, basically uh, when this cap shorted, it took out the screen voltage and therefore the oscillator stopped. So uh, basically the cap was taking the 40 or 50 or 60 volts that was there but it did not want to tolerate the full um, you know 200 volts with the regulator popped out. So um, I replaced it with a much larger capacitor here and uh, now we have the oscillator back. That's what's called an early failure and it was all my fault. So let's think uh, practically. We have two oscillators. One is the reference oscillator, one is the pitch oscillator. Now I went out of my way to try to make the reference oscillator as stable as possible. Even so, like any oscillator, it tends to drift low in frequency from cold to completely warmed up. The Hartley also drifts low. Now if these two oscillators were built exactly the same, they hopefully would stay somewhat in step as they both drift and the drift would cancel out in the mixer. So I think I've made a mistake here. I think I should have built the two oscillators identically, both Hartleys, with identical components, same coils, same capacitors, same resistors, same architecture, and I probably would have stood a better chance to get stability in a shorter amount of time. As it is, I don't reach complete stability with this set. I would say it takes 45 minutes to get complete zero beat stability. So 45 minutes is a long ways to wait to have complete stability. This is another advantage of using solid state, of course. You get what you get with tubes. 
This does not mean that the oscillators could not be compensated for temperature. We could use negative coefficient capacitors, which is the normal thing you do, and you could compensate each oscillator over temperature. That way it would uh, attain stability quicker. But most all oscillators, no matter what they are, will obtain stability given enough time to warm up and stabilize, as this has. Now the other thing we want to look at is the pitch, uh, the pitch distance. We haven't, I have not attempted to do any linearization or amplification of the pitch distance. So we have what we have. Okay, that's all we get. So you get the idea. I'm going to attempt to linearize this and make the pitch a little more sensitive so that we can stay within a few octaves. Okay, now I've set the tone for a few hundred hertz. see there is reaction out here but it's much less reaction than when we get very close that's what we want to linearize we also would like to increase the sensitivity a little bit So the other thing I'm doing is letting it cook, and that's important to allow the uh, the coils to, uh, you know, the the Q dope that I put on the coils, the polyurethane, let that harden up nice, and uh, the warm warmth of the chassis will get that cured up. So in this fairly crude looking setup, and as I start to think about tuning the antennas with the loading coils, I needed a way to pick up the energy of the antennas without coupling too closely. So I did have a ferrite rod uh, that I happened to have like uh, 90 turns of uh, wire on it. And it's untuned. I just simply connected that to the oscilloscope. And uh, this gives you a, a simple way to monitor the, the antenna's field uh, without loading it down too much. And, uh, you know, you don't have to use a big rod like that. You could use a smaller one like a broadcast band rod. But uh, it just gives me an easy way to tell that I'm actually tuning the antenna and peaking it. Uh, could you do this with a current pickup in the base of the antenna? Sure. Uh, something that you probably would want to build into the theremin rather than trying to hook something into it temporarily. But uh, this pickup idea, uh, once we start working with the loading coils, it will give me a very quick way of telling it that I'm getting to resonance. And yes, the orientation of the rod is correct. It is in the vertically polarized uh, orientation. So on the loading coils, I really kept it simple. Um, I wanted to wind my coils on ordinary PVC, and uh, since I was in a wooden box, I didn't have to worry too much about insulating them. Um, I was using uh, number 28 and number 26 wire and simply winding on a bunch of it and seeing if I was getting resonance. As I stuck these cheap $2 ferrite rods in, um, I used ATX power supplies and duct inductors uh, of this group here. Uh, this smaller group is certainly usable. 
but these are 79 cent one millihenry chokes that you can get uh, from Digikey or any uh, eBay vendor. So these are very inexpensive ways of, uh, of doing the, the loading uh, with these inductors. So now as we begin to uh, work on the loading, I'm going to be using a series of coils uh, to make up the, the loading on the uh, on the volume and the pitch. We'll start with the, the tone or the pitch antenna. It's calling for three millihenries. I've purchased some one millihenry chokes and I'm going to make up the third uh, inductor with a variable inductor so I can tune the antenna. I want to put the uh, adjustable inductor just below the antenna and then the fixed ones will be down closer to the uh, to the feed. And I'll make uh, some attempt uh, to keep those all in a vertical line going up to the antenna. So I now have a loading coil on the pitch antenna. You can see that uh, I have a, a coil and there's actually a ferrite bar which is halfway into the coil. And this has uh, certainly brought up the signal from the uh, from the antenna as picked up by the scope. And the pitch range has definitely increased. See, I'm getting effects way out here and I've got metal everywhere. There's no doubt it's more sensitive. We have a bigger field, so we're getting more, more of an effect. However, once you start to get close to resonance, and this is series resonance, on this antenna. Because we have the antenna attached to the top of a parallel tuned circuit oscillator, we are going to start stealing power to the point where we might lose our feedback and the oscillator stops oscillating properly. So we actually have to mistune it to bring it back into oscillation. This is not unusual. You can't put a short circuit at the top of an oscillator's coil. This is not how you feed an antenna. Uh, if we wanted to properly feed this antenna as a transmitter, for instance, we would use a low impedance link or a low impedance, uh, impedance converter of some kind, like a transformer. So as we approach resonance, we might get to a point where the oscillation stops. But we're getting the effect that we're hoping for. And this is the output with the ferrite rod out of the coil. As you can see, it's much lower. Um, and uh, it was lower still with no coil. So uh, definitely resonating the antenna increases the field intensity. And it uh, linearizes the pitch range. So this is a very good thing just have to get that coil straightened out so we have the proper inductance in there. Notice how the coil is vertical with the antenna. You don't want that at a right angle. Um, it's going to, to be more, most effective when it's uh, in the proper orientation. So I got tired of fooling around with the coils trying to uh, tune the antenna and I ended up just putting enough turns on this coil so that when I put this ferrite rod into it uh, about halfway in, it peaks up the output and we get more sensitivity. Now basically, it's just some dense foam, double side tape to the ferrite rod, which has been wrapped with Kapton. It's going to go in, and just through friction, it's going to stay where I put it. And then once it's in place, I might just put a little dab of RTV on each side, but uh, it's going to be tuned once and for all. Let's keep our eyes on the scope while I stick this thing in the bottom of the coil. Hopefully it will fit as nicely as it did on my test sample. See that? When you go too far, it freaks out a little bit. But Okay, we're definitely peaked up. We've got resonance. Okay, so
So because of the problem I'm having with uh, drift over temperature as the unit warms up, I decided to put two portholes below the two oscillator sections, uh, specifically under the tuned circuits. And uh, I put some feed on the unit to raise it up so that some cool air can uh, provide ventilation up from the bottom through the chassis, which is open on the bottom. And then uh, hopefully this will stabilize the unit so that it warms up more quickly. Just using ordinary uh, screening. This was some copper screening you use for EMI shielding, but it's just fine for this. And uh, hopefully this will improve the ventilation in the unit. It's also a good time uh, with the chassis out to look at the two loading coils. Uh, over here on the pitch side, I did end up using two 1 millihenry chokes and then the loading coil uh, to feed the antenna. On the volume side, uh, we have the, uh, the loading coil horizontal, and uh, that's of course so that the two coils are at right angles to one another. You can see they're at right angles. The pitch loading coil vertical with the monopole, and the horizontal coil uh, with the volume uh, antenna. Uh, the volume antenna required two 1 millihenry chokes in addition to the loading coil which is basically just uh, 250 turns of uh, number. I think this is a little heavier wire, actually. I think it's number 26 wire. And the pitch coil, I got away with just the coil itself, and it's 200 turns of number 28 wire. Uh, and both of these have the ferrite bars to tune them, which greatly increases the inductance. Okay, so this was the end of year, this was my end of year signature project, the theremin. And I can say that in five videos, I haven't even begun to touch all the secrets of this machine. But I can tell you I've learned a lot along the way. Just because something's operating at low RF frequencies and audio frequencies doesn't mean that it's trivial compared to some high frequency transceiver project that you might have in the works. I found this to be more difficult than many of the RF projects I've done. So the, uh, the box needed to be ventilated, that's something that I learned, because I wasn't going to go through the entire process of trying to compensate the oscillators. Let's see if we can get some sound out of it. Okay, not quite zero beat, but we're back there. The first thing that we should demonstrate is how much sensitivity the pitch antenna has. the volume antenna. you can see some of this. Uh, here we have the volume control loading coil and there's two 1 millihenry chokes. These are 99 cent chokes that I got. 
The sensitivity on the volume is okay. It's not fantastic, but uh, it's adequate. I simply peaked it up. Uh, these are ferrites, ferrite rods that have some foam on them, so when you push them into the PVC, they stay, stay where you put them. Then over Ooh. here, over here we have the pitch loading coil and that guy has finer wires and more turns finer wire and more turns and uh, the ferrite rod was enough to load that antenna it's operating at a higher frequency of course so it doesn't need as much loading we have the volume control the zero beat control line output speaker off fuse, ground, and the AC input. Okay, I don't know about you, but I've had just about as much theremin fun as I can handle. And uh, as you can see, I'm kind of in a Christmassy mood here. This was actually supposed to be a Christmas present for someone. But as you can see, I'm a couple weeks late. So I hope that everybody got something out of this theremin uh, video series. Uh, five videos to try to build a simple tube type unit. Seems like a lot, but uh, this is not trivial. Uh, this is not like you're just building a little one-tube radio or something. Uh, there's a lot uh, that needs to be uh, worked out when you're building something like this. And just because it's low frequencies we're talking about, and audio frequencies, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily an easy project.